We have two fantastic speakers today. Our first is Aisha Salazar. She's the Associate Extension Agent, Family and Consumer Sciences for Virginia Cooperative Extension in Arlington County and the City of Alexandria. She oversees the Master Food Volunteers and Master Financial Education Volunteers Program and co-leads the Energy Masters Program with EcoAction Arlington. In addition, Aisha serves as co-chair for the Arlington Healthy Community Action Team, is part of the Partnership for a Healthier Alexandria Steering Committee, serves on the board of the DC Food Recovery Working Group, and is a member of the Arlington Food Security Coalition, Alexandria Food Security Working Group, and the Fairfax Food Council. Along with Aisha will be Susan Sullivan Lagon. Before retiring from full-time teaching in 2015, Professor Lagon spent most of her professional life at Georgetown University, where she served on the faculties of both the Government Department and the Government Affairs Institute. She designed and taught American government and constitutional law classes to undergraduates on campus and courses about Congress for federal agency personnel on Capitol Hill. She has spoken for more than 500 international visitors programs sponsored by the U.S. Department of State and continues to lecture widely. She earned her BA and MA in government and foreign affairs at the University of Virginia and her PhD in government from Georgetown University. For the past several years, she has served as the hotel historian at the Jefferson Hotel, where she designs custom tours and interprets Thomas Jefferson's political, culinary, and architectural contributions to American life. She's a proud product of Arlington Public Schools and has been a Virginia Master Food Volunteer since 2014. She also serves on the boards of CHOW, the Culinary Historians of Washington. And with that, I will leave it to Aisha to get us started. Thanks for joining us. Great. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks for having us. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We're going to talk a little bit about managing the vegetable gardens over abundance. And to give you an idea of the topics we'll be covering, I'll discuss some recipes that you can use with extra produce. Susan will talk about food preservation safety and equipment and boil water, bath canning, and then some freezing, how to freeze different foods. And then I'll talk a little bit about herbs um, and some resources that you can access. So some recipe ideas. So some things that you can do with some extra produce that you might have on hand. Typical one is soups or stews. Those are great ones that you can also freeze for later. This is great for anything like tomatoes, kale, chard, peppers, onions, carrots, etc. You can also make some bread. Uh, I know bread was very popular during the pandemic. We were just talking about that. So you can use up any zucchinis you might have, apple, corn, pumpkin. And notice I'm just discussing things that you might actually be growing. You're probably not going to grow some bananas, so we're not going to mention that today. You can also make some desserts, so different cakes different pastries, different brownies and bars, using things like pumpkin, strawberries, corn, carrot, et cetera. And one recipe that you can try to do, this is one that I like a lot, is gazpacho. It's great for the summertime, especially because it's a cold soup. It's a traditional soup from Spain. And this one, you can use tons of tomatoes, cucumbers. You can put zucchini in it if you like. You can add some onions to give it some different flavors, garlic, anything like that. A vinegar base, and I put there different types of vinegars that you can choose from and then some olive oil, and then salt and, and pepper if you'd like. Also green peppers, you can use a lot of green peppers if you'd like. Just blend it all together, and then you can eat it as is. You can also put some toppings on it, so you can also top them and put them on top as well. Um, and Susan said she tried it last night and enjoyed it, so that was great to hear. So we are putting our words to practice here. Some other ideas, you know, the juices and smoothies, those are pretty common. We just did one, a recipe that I'll show you next with a group with Arlington 55 plus and everybody, you know, just really enjoyed it. We use peaches, you can use berries, kale, spinach, any leafy greens are great for smoothies. It's a great way to get your veggies in if you're not used to eating salads, um, for example, or sauteing them. Carrots, beets, apples, beets will give your smoothies a nice like red, uh, pinkish color. Um, you can thicken up your smoothies with things like pumpkin, sweet potatoes butternut squash, cauliflower, and carrots. And then the bonus is you can turn them into popsicles or ice cream and eat them later as well. So this is the recipe we did the other day. It's a peach creamsicle smoothie. Um, you can use peaches. And this recipe was coming from Florida Extension, so that's why they say Florida <laughs> peaches, Florida orange juice. But any peaches that you grow, any orange juice, you can use ice cubes unless you have like frozen peaches that you've frozen already, yogurt. We also did this by adding other fruits in there that you know you typically don't grow but it's a great recipe it kind of brings you back to your childhood and summer days so this is a great one to try as well some other ideas are making sauces like pasta sauce or applesauce a pesto or chimichurri i love making both of those i don't have a large garden but that's typically what i use my diesel and cilantro for 
And then you can make any type of fritters, sweet or savory ones with potatoes, sweet potatoes, corn, zucchini. Um, those are all some great options as well. I don't know if there are any questions at the moment, but if there are, we can take some time to answer them. No questions just yet, although I think you're making folks hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to switch to Susan and she is going to talk next. Thank you. And we really appreciate the invitation to have the chance to come and talk to you. My task is to go through some of the equipment and some of the basics about canning. And I see this as sort of an advertisement for the Extension Services online course. If you're really interested in this, the Extension Service offers an online course that you can sign up for and it's self-paced. So you don't have to do it on a specific day and I highly recommend it to you. So let's get started um, with the obvious question here, which is why preserve foods? <laughs> Um, and the obvious reason is to prevent spoilage and to extend its shelf life. But we like to distinguish between a couple types of spoilage, the not so pleasant one and the genuinely dangerous one. So the not so pleasant one would be things that make things maybe taste a little less appealing. Maybe the texture is a little bit off in things, but the microbiological spoilage would be things like molds, yeast, bacteria, some of which you can see, some of which you can't. The chemical spoilage would be enzymatic changes. And then the physical spoilage, water loss typically, or bruising. And canning is probably the most long lasting way to preserve some things. And I'll just start by saying, there are some things that do not can well. Any of you who grow melons, you just can't really can melon. You can put it in a blender and put them in those little ice pop molds and make popsicles, just like Aisha was saying with the smoothies and that's fine. But um, most things that you grow, you can preserve. And canning is just preservation by heat. The function of the heat is to destroy microorganisms and to inactivate the enzymes. And the container is sealed during the process to prevent it from being contaminated. So there are all sorts of sources of contamination, even just from the air, from people, from surfaces that you might be using. So we wanna always start with a clean workspace. And you also, if you're gonna be canning, you wanna start with some time. This is not something you can do in between doing other things. You need to set aside a few hours and just have at it and enjoy it. So spoilage microorganisms are the things that cause food to go bad. And they're not pathogens. In other words, they won't make you sick. They just are kind of gross. <laughs> pathogens are the things that make you sick. And we always start this way because this is the really important thing. Fortunately, Botulism is not much of a problem in the U.S. in commercially packaged products. The main source of botulism, which again is rare, actually comes from home canning and improper canning methods. So that's the reason that Virginia Cooperative Extension is very, very careful about basing all of our recommendations to be as food safety conscious as we possibly can be. And botulism is a neurotoxin. You can't see it, you can't smell it, but it can be fatal. So this is the reason that we scare you at first so that you'll follow the instructions that we provide. Low acid canned foods are the proper environment for botulism. And that means a lot of the things that you grow, with the exception of tomatoes and most fruits, a lot of the vegetables are gonna fall into that low acid category. And for those things, we recommend that you use pressure canning, not boiling water bath canning. And again, the extension offers their course. It will cover that. It will touch on fermentation as well, something a lot of people are very interested in. And I will start with a disclaimer here and say, I do lots and lots of water bath canning. I don't do much by way of pressure canning. I've done it a couple of times, but I'm definitely not the expert. And I say that because for those of you who are new to canning, water bath canning is easy. If I can do it, anyone can do it. I did not have grandmothers who did this sort of thing. So I was brand new when I started as a master food volunteer. And I took a couple of the workshops that Extension offered. And now I am 
a relatively proficient canner, at least as far as water bath canning goes. Just be aware, this list here will tell you what the high acid and low acid foods are. And you don't have to test with pH. You've already tested all this for you. So we know which things are going to be high acid and low acid. One thing to point out, we've called tomatoes high acid foods here. But recently, we've suggested acidifying tomatoes, which means adding either vinegar at 5% or adding some lemon juice. And it's occasionally possible to find vinegars that are 4%. And we just had a letter from Extension saying, if you have things that are canned with less than 5% vinegar, you should probably toss them. We want to be extra careful. I went to the grocery store the other day, and frankly, it's almost impossible to find anything that isn't 5%. If you just buy your standard, very affordable white vinegar, it's likely to be 5%. But go ahead and check the label just to make certain. What type of canner? This gets to the when do you need to pressure can and when can you go ahead and do the water bath canning. And for high acid foods, the water bath canning is absolutely fine. The acidified foods are things like if you pickle, you, by definition, you'll have some sort of vinegar in there. Salsas usually will as well. Tomatoes. And by acidified, we just mean that you add a little bit of extra acid. Recipes will always tell you what you can add. And we recommend that you use bottled lemon juice if it calls for lemon juice. For those of you uh, like me who love fresh lemon and fresh lime juice, the reason we recommend the bottled lemon juice is because, again, we know the acid content and we know that it's safe for canning, whereas you can't always be sure with the lemon, depending on how much you use and so forth. So that's why we recommend it. Just a few really important things to mention. Uh, always use a recipe from a reputable source. And in the materials that were sent out to accompany this presentation, we have a nice bibliography that's short and very reliable of some books and some other sources online that will give you reputable recommendations. Again, since we do this through the extension service, we wanna make sure that what you're doing is safe so that you don't get sick and so that you don't make your friends sick. Begin with clean hands and a clean work area and Processing times, which is how long you're going to boil things, um, are not estimates. You really do need to have a timer handy. If something says to boil or to process for 20 minutes, for example, this past weekend, I just made some peaches. Here are my peaches. They have to process for 20 minutes. 20 minutes is not 18 minutes. It's 20 minutes. So you want to keep a timer handy. And you also probably want to keep an extra pot of boiling water on the stove. A little bit later on, we'll show you all of the equipment that you can use for boiling water bath canning. But this is my great big pot, granite ware pot. And this is probably the most common thing used for water bath canning. It has this nice rack that fits inside. So it keeps jars off the bottom so boiling water can surround them. It also allows jars to have at least an inch of space above them for processing because you need it to boil all around the jar. So that's what the hot water on the stove is for. When you put your jars in, if it's not quite up to an inch, you have the hot water right there to boil. And that's gonna be something you'll be grateful for, trust me. Some methods that are not recommended for canning. Uh, one is what we call open kettle canning. So you wanna get a pot with a lid and that's really all you need is a big pot that has a lid in which you can fit a rack. So I just went online to look at this and the equipment that I'm gonna be talking about, you can get pretty much at any hardware store. You can get it at places like Home Depot or Lowe's, Target, Walmart, uh, or of course you can just go online and look at canning supplies. and. The good news is it's surprisingly affordable. You can get one of these big pots like this for about $25. You can get the rack inside for about 10. And then some of the equipment I'm gonna show you in a minute here, you can get 
kits for about $15. So it's not expensive. You need to get jars. And that's becoming a little bit more challenging because during the pandemic, it seemed canning had a real renaissance and everybody wanted to do some home preservation. So we don't know if it's because people needed some jam to put on all that sourdough bread everyone was baking, but for whatever reason, online is probably still a good source. I have had occasion to go to hardware stores and have them actually be out of wide mouth jars for a short time. So they'll get them back in, but it's just something to be aware of. Things we don't want you to do. Don't process in an oven or a microwave or heaven forbid, a dishwasher. Every so often there are articles I've seen online. I've seen them on Instagram. I know there are lots of TikToks about this where people are canning things in their dishwasher. Don't do it. It's not safe. You don't know whether the water gets to a boiling point at 212 degrees or not. If it does, you don't know how long it stays at that boiling point. So just help us out here and help your families out and keep everyone healthy by not using your dishwasher for canning. Another thing I want to point out in the literature we sent you, it's a little bit confusing. It mentions steam canners in the Can It Safely guide. And I want to ask all of you if you if you have printed this, it looks like this. It says can it safely on page two where it says steam canning is okay for high acid foods, just put an X through that. It probably is, but again, out of an abundance of caution, we suggest that you do everything in boiling water bath canning on your stove. Canning at pressures, again, for those of you who are gonna be canning um, low acid foods, canning at pressures greater than 15, we don't recommend. And this is an important one. We don't recommend that you use any kind of plastic or one piece zinc or porcelain lined caps. If you go to some stores, like for example, Williams Sonoma, they have those cute French jars with the clasp and the rubber seal. They're really nice. So, you know, put some things like nuts that you're gonna keep in the fridge or um, beans or what have you in those. Don't can in those. You can't guarantee the seal. So we want you to be safe and we want you to use a seal that has rubber inside. Your typical canning jars that you're gonna buy, the companies that are most available are Ball and Kerr. And they're two piece lids, they look like this. They come in two different sizes. Well, they come in multiple sizes, but the two that you're gonna use will be this one for smaller jars and then a larger one for bigger jars. And that's gonna be the sort of industry standard and the one that we most recommend. So a few recent updates for those of you who've been canning for a long time. There are some things that we say you shouldn't really be canning. It's not as safe. Summer squash, we would put in that category and zucchini. And I know for those of you with all that zucchini, uh, you're wondering what to do. And fortunately, you can freeze zucchini. So we'll get there in a bit. The other thing to do is make new friends and find neighbors who are going to be delighted to take your zucchini off of your hands. Uh, tomato product acidity isn't uniform. And that's the reason that we're now telling you, assume that tomatoes are low acid, even though they're probably okay, it's always safer to add the tablespoon of bottled lemon juice or a quarter teaspoon of citric acid. You can get vitamin C. Some people crunch up vitamin C tablets. It's also much easier to just buy the powdered version of citric acid or frankly, to buy a bottle of lemon juice. So for the pint, it's a tablespoon. For a quart, it's two tablespoons. And again, that's an extension recommendation. Some of your older recipes might not say that. That's the reason that we are encouraging you to just make a note of that. When you're adding acid, it should go directly into the jar before you fill the jar. Again, we just make sure that it's all there and doesn't linger up at the top. You can also use vinegar, again, 5%. And for those of you lucky enough to be doing things with figs and Asian pears, assume those are low acid as well. Those pretty half gallon jars are nice, but they're really better for decoration than for actually canning. 
for half gallons, you can follow recipes that have apple and grape juice, another source of sugar. Sometimes you can make a simple syrup and put that over the things. Again, your recipe will always tell you. One of the reasons we recommend ball and curd is that they're relatively affordable. They're very widely available. They're BPA free. And in the old days, you used to have to heat, even in boiling water, the lids and the rims. And now we recommend that you don't. It can actually interfere with the seal. So this rubberized surface has been modified so that it works without heating, which is a wonderful thing. So headspace is important. This is what you use to make certain that your seal will suction properly. I don't know what the proper verb would be, but let me show you some things here that will help illustrate this. Here's my little tiny jar. These are great for jams and things. When you fill it, it will tell you in a recipe what the headspace is. And typically for jams, it'll be a quarter inch. For fruits or tomatoes, it'll be a half inch. This little tool comes in a kit with what I would identify as the really essential tools to have. And there are only three. This one is used to measure headspace. And I know it's very hard to see here. See these little stair steps with measurements on them? You put it in like this, and then you just see whether the liquid that you're using, or if it's something like salsa, the substance in there comes up to the measurement that you want. So when I did these peaches, it was a half an inch, and it was very easy to tell how much headspace is in there. This end is used to remove air bubbles because you want as much air as possible to come out during the processing portion of canning. And the way these lids work is they're strong enough to make the seal eventually, but you want to make them just fingertip tight so they're loose enough for the air to escape. The head space is also important to keep things from discoloring. And I'm really proud of this one. This is the tomatilla salsa I made. It was the very first thing I ever canned by myself nine years ago now. And I certainly wouldn't want to necessarily eat it, but I love it to show that the salsa at the top has not discolored. And that's because there's sufficient headspace. So the air didn't get to it, if that makes any sense to you. You need headspace also for the expansion of food. Any of you who have ever frozen something only to have it spill over, you're familiar with this already. It's also what forms the vacuum in these jars. And this might be a little tricky to see, but I hope maybe you can. If you look at this, notice that there's a little button and on ball and curve jar lids, this button is really helpful because when something seals, the lid becomes concave. It says, let me see, if you, can you see that? How sort of like a little dimple in there? That's what you want. And the headspace allows for that vacuum to form. So it's important. It's not an optional thing to fill something up to the, lid, the um, place it tells you to. So we mentioned reliable recipe, mentioned the canner. And again, let me just stand back here so you can see it better. This one is made by a company called Granite Ware. It's definitely the most common. You can get really fancy stainless steel ones for $200, or you can get this one for $25 to $30. And this is the important part. You don't have to use a rack like this. If you have something that fits well and will keep the jars from bumping against each other, by all means do. I would still recommend getting one of these just because it's so easy. It can stand like this if you want to cool things off. I love it because you can lift these out to fill and then you just put it right in the canner and it sits just inside like that. So if this is an essential piece of equipment too, for sure. You also need the mason type jars um, with the lids and the bands. 
And this is something really important. The jars you can reuse over and over and over again. The bands you can reuse over and over again. You do need to inspect them each time though. So you wanna make sure that there aren't any nicks on the edge that could interfere with a nice seal. You wanna make sure that there aren't any cracks. Uh, my pal Stacy, who does these presentations with me for garden talks at the Arlington Library the other day said she had an experience recently where it was the jars um, and the bottom of the jar just completely fell out. So again, you wanna inspect your jars and make sure that they're okay. You also want to inspect the rims because these you save and can use over. But when I was canning peaches, I was wondering why my canning liquid after I was done looked a little bit pink. <laughs> and it was because some of that juice from the headspace siphoned out. And I don't know if you can see here. There's actually a little dent. Is that one? Um, there's a little dent in this, which again, I didn't notice when I put it on. So you want to make sure and inspect that as carefully as you can. Another thing that's sort of essential equipment is a funnel. And this is so that you can fill the jar without having to touch things or without getting half of whatever it is you're canning down the side of the jar. So the funnel is really, really helpful. This is your bubble tool, which doubles for headspace. And the other thing that is not essential, but sure is nice to have, is one of these little magnets. And again, this came in the kit that I got from Ball. And I just saw them at a couple of hardware stores this past week. I was looking to see at one hardware store, it was I think $15.99 to get the kit that had multiple things, including this little magnet, which is just really fantastic for lifting your clean lid and placing it on top of the jar. You wanna use quality produce. Again, if it's not in great shape going in, it won't be in great shape going out. That said, with some things, if they're a little past their prime, like those bananas that are starting to go or peaches or nectarines that are a little bit overripe, I always freeze those. And then they're fantastic in smoothies. And I love being able to just open the freezer and see some of that fruit just ready to go for me to toss right into the blender. So and notice here, we even say several hours for making sure you have enough time. The jars and lids, again, I think we've talked about that. Screw band, this is important too, as opposed to the ones that sort of fold over and seal. When you do these, you leave these on while they process and then you take them off. So for those of you who have gotten gifts from people, and I confess I do this myself, I put a cute little piece of fabric over and then tighten the band. That's great. But if you receive one like that, take the band off, take the fabric off. It's nice for presentation, but you don't want anything on here. You don't want this to rust or corrode. You want to be able to reuse it again. I also wanted to show you when we were talking about the importance of the lids and that little button here. When there's a tight suction on it, it won't pop. So I'm going to show you in a little bit ways to test to make sure that you have a good seal. But anyway, USDA recommends these. They're easy to find. There's no reason not to use them. Closing the jar, you'll see in recipes, it'll tell you to do hot pack or cold pack. You put the food in first, and then you remove the air bubbles to the extent that you can. In some foods, like big pieces, like these peaches, there are bubbles all over the place in here. You get them out as best you can, but since this is in a syrup, it's okay that there's some bubbles. You want to remove as much oxygen as you possibly can. It's impossible to get it all out of there. If it bubbles a little bit, no problem. If it bubbles and foams, then you probably have something going on that you don't want. So if it's clear, you're okay. You pack the food, you remove the air bubbles, you check the head space, so you measure around, uh, make sure you've got sufficient head space. This is important. You take a cloth and wipe the rim. I just take a kitchen towel with hot water, wipe the rim. Then you put the lid on, close it, and you remove the band after processing and cooling, which is actually 24 hours. After you do it, you're gonna leave them rest for a bit. You're going to lift the jars, and this is the other piece of essential equipment. 
This is a jar lifter. And here's some salsa I made last year. And this will lift the larger wide mouth ones. It will lift, and Stacy made some beautiful tart cherry jam. It'll lift the little ones. This is really helpful when you're trying to lift those jars out. Remember they're slippery and they're really hot. It's just so much easier to use this. I use it actually when I'm putting them in as well because you're gonna have a can of boiling water that you're working with. So you're gonna lift the jars. You're gonna put the jars on just a regular kitchen dish towel and you're gonna allow them to cool for a while before you check their seal. And online, there are lots of different recommendations for how to check a seal. I still think the safest one is look for the button. If you have a lid that doesn't have a button, you can sort of look across and see if it's concave, that's what you want. And the acid test is to lift it with your fingertips and that lid should not come off. You can also turn it upside down and that lid should not come off and you know that it's a good seal. One of the most rewarding things about canning is when you take them out of the canner, you will hear these pops, we call it the ping, and it's just such a gratifying sound. And that's when that vacuum forms. So it's a little bit like this, that, that noise you hear once the vacuum seals. You're gonna take a look at it after 24 hours, but leave it alone for 24 hours. If you're canning quartz, as I was, it takes a little bit longer sometimes for that ping. If you're canning little jars, sometimes it'll ping right when you take it out of the water, which is great. It doesn't matter how long it takes, so long as it seals within 24 hours. So you're gonna leave it. If the seal has not worked, you've got a couple choices. One is do it over again. In other words, reprocess it. So go through the whole thing. I am way too lazy to do that. So if I have something that doesn't seal, and it's rare, I've only had it happen a couple of times, put it in the fridge and eat it within a couple of days. Or you can freeze whatever is in there, not in the jar, obviously. You're going to remove the jar. You're going to label when you did something. So here's my friend Stacy's jam. She's got it nicely labeled with the date. She just made it here. Always a good idea. Some people like to put what it is if you're giving it to people, certainly. Usually you can sort of tell by looking at it, but you definitely want to put the date on there. We will tell you to use it within a year. In reality, it's probably safer for much longer than that. But again, extension is always going to err on the side of caution. Store it in a cool, dark place. You don't want it in direct sunlight. And the other thing is you don't want to stack them. Um, sometimes when you see those shells with, you know, all sorts of things stacked up and they look so pretty and appealing. If you possibly can, you wanna have things in a single layer. Stacking them can actually weaken the seal. Where to buy things, I think I mentioned before, you can get canning supplies at hardware stores, at Home Depot and Lowe's, Target, Walmart, online, pretty easy to find. Again, you've already seen a lot of this, which is fine, but. Any big pot will do, but it needs to be big enough. If you're going to be processing things that are quart-sized jars, especially, it needs to be big enough because you need to have that water boiling over the top. See, this is one in action here, so you can see how that works. You also want to make sure that you get the water actually boiling. So it needs to be a real rolling boil. And that's when you start timing, is when it's boiling. It's not uncommon for the water to cool off a little bit when you put everything in there. That's the reason for having that pot of water on the stove so that you can top it up and get it right back to boiling again. You're going to load the jars again with the lifter because you have boiling water in that can. So you want to be extremely careful. And once you have all of them in and the water is still boiling, you start your timing. You're going to turn off the heat when you're done and you're going to wait for five minutes, and this is important. It's, you're eager to get those things and listen for those pings, but take the lid off and just wait a little bit until the water has sort of died down. One of the reasons for this is you don't really want the jars bumping against each other too much. And as soon as you have that canner lifted up, you've given it some more space to bump around. So wait for a few minutes. If you're working with something that browns, you can use ascorbic acid, again, just vitamin C. Occasionally, I've worked with things that I would expect to brown, and they haven't. Um, when I did peaches recently, 
I put in maybe a couple teaspoons of bottled lemon juice and it was fine. This isn't a requirement. This is just a make it look appealing thing. And you can get powdered form ascorbic acid. It's easily found. If you do a lot of canning, I would recommend it. Otherwise, see what happens. I've made applesauce and it hasn't browned. So, you know, you, you can give it a test and see what you think. Jams and jellies are something I recommend because they're very rewarding. It's big bang for the buck with jams and jellies. And if you're making jam or jelly, the recipe will tell you how long you need to cook the jam and with what. And it will probably tell you if you need to add some acid, some sort of vinegar, for example, or the other night someone was telling us about a fig preserve that she makes with some rosemary and some red wine in it. You will also, for jams and jellies, usually add pectin. And pectin is a naturally occurring substance in lots of fruits, but you can help it along by adding some as well. And this is a powder and these are empty. I've used up all of my pectin here. You can even get one that's for low or no sugar canning. And again, your recipe is your best guide. Most jams and jellies, I'll just be honest, use a ton of sugar. <laughs> and that's why they taste great. But for those of you who are conscious of that, there are more and more recipes that are lower in sugar. And I have used this and I'm happy to say it works, the low, low pectin. There's a brand that many of you may know called Clear Gel. What pectin does is give jams and jellies that wonderful texture where it's sort of the gelatinous texture where they hold together so that it's not too watery. So that's what it's in there for. Here are my examples and I'm gonna toggle around a little bit here. Let me start with the big pot there. Those are my peaches that I started doing. And I thought I may as well take pictures because I'm going to be doing this. To blanch peaches, just like for those of you who do lots of tomatoes, if you make your own tomato sauce, you're going to cut an X in the bottom, just score them. And then you're going to just give them a quick dip in boiling water, just 30 seconds or so. And then you're going to take them out of the boiling water and just let them cool off a little bit. And then the skins just peel right off. It's a really gratifying experience <laughs> to get those skins off. And I just put them in a bowl of cold water to keep them from turning brown and put in, like I said, a, a, maybe a teaspoon or two of lemon juice. It's not enough that you're gonna taste it later. Uh, so it really doesn't matter. While that's happening, the canner is on the stove and I turn it on so that it'll boil. And it takes a good while to get a big can like that up to a boil. Meanwhile, I'm preparing my jars and I put them out on a towel. Just wanna make sure that my jars are nice and sterile. What I typically do is put them in the dishwasher and I'll run it on an express cycle and leave them in there warm so that they're warm. This is important, particularly if you're doing jams or jellies or you're doing any hot pack recipes. Um, because otherwise your jars can crack on you. Again, just like you wouldn't take something out of the freezer and put it directly into an oven. You want to make sure that your jars are nice and warm and prepared for whatever hot substance is going to go in there. Next, for a lot of recipes, it'll tell you to pack them in a syrup. And you can do a very light syrup, which is what I did. If you make a simple syrup, the recipe is going to be one to one. So it's going to be one cup of sugar to one cup of water. I never make them that sweet. I always make them less syrupy. Some people will tell you you can even can them in water if you're doing things like fresh fruit. I've tried that. And frankly, you lose a little bit of the color that way. So I'll do, and this was a half cup sugar to one cup of water. And then you distribute it evenly in your jars. And again, I'm just doing a very few jars here. You distribute it evenly. And if you don't have enough to fill all of them, you can make some more, or you can just top those up again with boiling water. So that works equally well. Then they go into the canner and they're coming out of the canner there at the bottom left. And they're going onto that towel where they're going to rest happily for 24 hours until 
this last picture here on the right, and that's me testing them <laughs> to make sure that the seal is sufficient. So I thank you for your patience and indulgence. And if you have any questions. Yes, thank you very much, Susan. We have a few questions here. I mean, we might have some more rolling in as we start. One question is about eggplant and whether that is a good substitute for canning. Um, I know you're talking about freezing in the next segment. So if it's a better one for freezing, we can talk about it then. But for canning, what about eggplant? This is a great question. And this is one that I will confess to you. I've never done it myself. I have frozen eggplant, but I've frozen it in a prepared form. I have a casserole recipe that I love to make, or I've frozen eggplant farm before. That's the only way I know to do it. I just don't know. But later while Aisha's talking, I can look it up because I have one of our Bibles. It's a book from the um, Georgia, University of Georgia Extension Service. And any of you who are... Um, eager to really get into canning. I can't recommend this book enough. It's called So Easy to Preserve. It's kind of the Bible. I'm going to look up eggplant later and I promise I'll get back to you with a response. Okay. <laughs> that one, I just don't know. Great. Another question was about processing, I guess, more along the savory line. So they gave examples, you know, beyond sauerkraut, beyond kimchi, beyond, you know, pickled cucumbers. Any thoughts on processing, I guess, more on, on the savory end? Sure. There's some things, for example, one thing that I remember learning to do when I took my first class through the extension service was dilly green beans, and they have plenty of vinegar in there, as well as a little bit of seasoning, and those were just water bath canned. A lot of savory things, if they're acidified, are going to be fine. There's some things, for example, asparagus, you're just going to have to do that in a pressure canner. It's not difficult, and there is literature available on how to do that. Again, I'm not the practitioner on that score. But with a lot of other things, you can certainly make things that are plenty savory. I mean, I would include all the salsas in that category. You can see the little jalapenos here in this salsa. This is a wonderful recipe. When we talk about reputable recipes, it doesn't mean that the only sources are the extension are so easy to preserve. Pretty much anything that comes from an extension service online is going to be okay. The ones that give me pause are the ones that come from sources that you can't really verify. And Aisha and I were just talking about this earlier too. Sometimes you'll see recipes for people infusing their own oils, which sounds really tasty, but it's just an invitation to botulism unless you're putting them in the refrigerator. So Again, um, we're going to always err on the side of caution. Great. Thank you. And then thinking about caution, this kind of ties into the next question, which is about um, shelf life. And so you mentioned a year to be safe, but it could possibly be safer for a longer period. And one person asked about 18 months. If the seal is intact, if everything looks good, is there any other reason why you wouldn't have something that's been preserved longer? Is there a potential nutritional loss or nutritional value loss or anything like that? Uh, in canned items, the texture might deteriorate over a certain amount of time. In frozen items, the texture definitely will deteriorate some. But again, I will tell you through confessions, I have had canned things that I've canned two or three years prior and I'm still here. Virginia Cooperative Extension will tell you they're shelf stable for a year. <laughs> so that's sort of the official line. I had someone at the library the other night say that she remembers eating things that her mom canned, you know, 10 years prior and she was yeah. fine. Chances are it's okay. But again, we wouldn't really want you to risk it. So my response now is if you have more than you can use, make friends and give it to them as gifts. <laughs> Great. Um, and then just one question, just clarification with the actual materials. The jars can be reused. They call these screw band and jars, and these can be reused over and over and over again. You want to take these off, and I actually have this one. Notice I call it sample. I want to show you, if you can see inside there, it looks kind of gross. It's a little bit rusted. So you always want to inspect them before you use them. 
this is another reason that you want to take them off after 24 hours and store them however you like. Put them in a Ziploc that says reusable screw tops if you want. The lids are the things that you have to use fresh ones each time. And that's because it's already done its job once. It's given you a nice seal the way it's supposed to once. You just can't be sure that it's going to do that a second time. So you can get the box of lids. These are available online. I just checked before I came this morning to make sure when I'm telling you what various things cost and where you can find them. There's a lot of stuff online about how hard it is to find canning jars. Well, if you can mass quantities, maybe it's hard, but for what we would want, where you want to order, you know, a package of eight jars and a box of, let's see, this is 12 lids, that's still pretty readily accessible. Because there was a shortage, there were a lot of people who were unfortunately reusing lids, and that's just never a good idea. So you don't want to do that. Just want to show you the canner thing again, just to make sure you see how it lifts things off the bottom and how nicely it fits in here. And then you just lift it nice and easy. After it's cooled, I always find it easier rather than putting my hand down in that boiling water, even with the jar lifter, get some hot mitts and just put it up on the side. Here's one thing that's really nice to have if you get into doing jam. And again, it's not essential, but it sure is nice. It has a little hook on it so that it will stay on the side of a pot. When you're canning with jam, your stove is occupied because you've got your extra boiling water, you've got your canner, and you've got your pot of whatever jam you're making. And this thing is really helpful for filling the jars. It's about a cup or so, and it just fits so nicely. <laughs> but again, this is not essential equipment. Um, it's just sort of a nice thing to have. The other thing you need if you're canning, for some reason, most recipes will tell you to use a wooden spoon. I don't know why you can't use a silicone spoon. Maybe you can, but if it says wooden spoon, I'm gonna use a wooden spoon. This actually has little markings along here um, that will show you. Yeah, there we go. Sort of tell that that's like, and again, could you use a regular ruler? Sure, but this is easy to use and it also has a nice purpose of debubbling your jars. So why wouldn't you use it? Freezing is probably one of the easiest things for people to do to preserve produce. And I will say again, some of it works better than others. There's some things that actually freeze beautifully. The advantages of freezing is freezing usually you can keep something's natural color pretty well it's easy usually you can keep the texture somewhat it doesn't take you very long there's virtually no equipment that you need other than freezer bags or hard-sided freezer containers it's pretty simple the disadvantage is probably one of the biggest ones is texture changes things are going to get mushy that's just the way it is um, the, of course, energy cost and space, you know, there's only so much freezer space for most of us and you have to decide how you want to use it best. The other thing is that there are some pathogens that can survive. So at least with canning, you know, that you've gotten the dangerous stuff out of there. I think with freezing again, I've never had an issue with it, but it's just good to be aware. So those are the, the pluses and the minuses. What you're doing with freezing is trying to slow down the enzymes. And again, you can't destroy the enzymes, but you can slow them down. And one of the great advantages of that is that you retain the color in most things. And we always recommend for vegetables that you blanch them. My friends who are master gardeners would laugh to see me doing a talk for master gardeners because all I grow are peppers, lots and lots of peppers and herbs. I don't really grow any other vegetables, but my peppers come in like crazy. And like I say, I've had good luck just freezing them whole. The other thing about freezing things is exactly like canning. If you have things that are likely to brown, just put some vitamin C on there, some ascorbic acid. The texture changes, and this is important. This is the crystallization thing. The water in food is going to freeze as it expands. 
and those ice crystals will rupture the cell walls. So there are some vegetables, those that have really high water content that just don't freeze well. Lettuce, sadly, is one. Celery doesn't freeze well. Tomatoes depends. My suggestion with tomatoes is go ahead and can them instead because they do can very well. But just a couple points about freezing I wanted to mention to you um, uh, Susan? as well. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, it's Nicole, sorry to interject, but could we advance to the freezing slide? Let me just back up so that you can see the others. And again, you have access to these, you can check them out later, but just to show you what we were mentioning before. Oxygen is the enemy when you freeze things. So you wanna get as much air out as you can if you're freezing things in plastic bags. And I've got a couple of recommendations for you. One is flash freeze things. Take a rimmed baking sheet and freeze things in small pieces. So chop your peaches or your nectarines, freeze your blueberries or your strawberries or your grapes individually. When you have that banana that's starting to go, slice it and flash freeze it. And then because they're small pieces, the smaller pieces freeze faster. The faster the freeze, the smaller the crystals, it's just much, much faster. And then take them from the rim baking sheet and toss them in a Ziploc bag. And I like to store my Ziploc bags flat with things in them. First off, I can fit a lot more in my freezer. And as I mentioned before, I do love being able to open the freezer and just see those bags and grab a couple and toss them into a smoothie. But if you're going to use them for baking or in some other recipe later on, it's just an easy way to sort of keep track of them. I do the same thing, by the way, for soups. So if you're taking all that produce and you're making some nice vegetable soups or you're making Aisha's gazpacho, I always eat it too fast. I've never tried freezing it. It might freeze. It's a lot of tomato and cucumber, so it might get a little watery, but who knows? I'll, I'll have to give that a try. With any other kinds of vegetable soups, by all means, put them in freezer bags. And here, show you the containers. These are just your straightforward Ziploc freezer bags. A little tip for you is I always have a four cup Pyrex cup, or you could use a bowl, or I'm talking to master gardeners, you can use a flower pot. Take a pot and put your bag in it and fold the edges over. That way you have two hands to use for filling the bag, just a little bit simpler. Fill the bag, close it, and then flatten it. You want to get as much air out as you can, but then you have this nice flat bag for storing, and I actually keep them upright. Um, if you want, you can be compulsive like me, and you can alphabetize them so that bananas come before peaches, whatever, but it's a very easy way to freeze things. Frozen is never going to have the same texture as fresh. There'll always be some ice crystals, but another tip that relates to that, since oxygen is the enemy. For those of you who make guacamole and you have it in your fridge and the top gets brown because it oxidizes, take a piece of plastic wrap and put it directly on the surface. Do the same thing for your ice cream. After you open that carton of ice cream or frozen yogurt, put a piece of plastic wrap right on the surface so you minimize the contact with the rest of the air in that carton. And it will actually keep those crystals minimal. Nothing will get rid of them, but it'll keep them minimal. The rigid straight-sided packaging is also really good. You can freeze in glass. Uh, make sure that your lid is tight and also remember headspace. Make sure you leave a little bit of room for expansion. I've had this happen a couple of times to me where I've overfilled something. It's happened to me twice with soup. I've overfilled it and I go to take it out and it's sort of oozed over the top, and then things will get freezer burned, which is what you want to avoid. For those of you who have vacuum sealers, the illustration here, we show you one there. Um, those are terrific too. I don't, I just use regular Ziplocs and I haven't had any problem. Another thing that we're very fond of is using ice cube trays. If you have a whole bunch of lemons or limes that you're not going to be able to use. I'll just juice them, put the juice in an ice cube tray, put the frozen cubes in a bag, and then I always have at least somewhat fresh juice to use. It's also great 
for things that you don't use the full container. For example, what do you do with the other half can of tomato paste? Or what do you do with the other half can of coconut milk? Or chicken broth, which if you look at a box of chicken broth, it'll tell you you should use it within seven to 10 days. Well, if you haven't used the whole thing, freeze it. Of course, if you're making your own stock, Extension will give you a gold star and tell you that's much healthier for you. But any of your own stock, you can freeze that in ice cube trays as well. The thing I freeze probably more than anything else is pesto. Aisha mentioned before chimichurri or pesto or herbs. Um, you can freeze in either water or in oil and use it as you need it. And it is really nice in the dead of winter to be able to go to your freezer and find those summer fruits and vegetables, not to mention those nice herbs. So anybody have any questions about the freezing things? Um, no questions about freezing. So I think we're okay. Um, one person mentioned that frozen tomatoes work well in soups, chili, and spaghetti sauce with, with the texture. That's a nice thing to have. So Susan mentioned some tips that even though I teach a lot of this, I tend to forget sometimes why haven't I frozen that chicken stock, you know, when I'm using it. So those are some, some great ways to reduce waste and just have more on hand for down the road. So for some herbs in general, the best time to harvest herbs is just before the flower is first open in the early morning after the dew has evaporated to minimize any wilting, try to avoid bruising the leaves. They should not lie in the sun or if unattended after harvesting. Rinse herbs in cool water and then gently shake them to remove any excess moisture. Try to discard any bruised, soiled, imperfect, or dead leaves and stems. And I'll show you in a little bit just some of the ones that I picked. Some of them have some bruising on them. And you gardeners will know more than I do about what some of these spots are on <laughs> these <laughs> herbs. You can do a couple different things in terms of drying them or freezing them. Air drying, that's what a lot of people tend to do. You expose the leaves, flowers, or seeds to warm, dry air. Leave the herbs in a well-ventilated area until the moisture evaporates. I've also seen some extension articles mentioning that you can hang them outdoors, kind of in a covered area, away from sunlight. I've seen some also, like it says here, you can use tender herbs, put them in dry paper bags, or you can vent the holes prevent mold, and then in small bunches. Tie the stems together into small little bunches, and then hang them in temperate, well-ventilated, darkened room with little dust. And then it should take up to two weeks for them to actually dry up. And then make sure you label them. Sometimes some things kind of look similar, so you might want to label them just in case. You can also dry them in the oven, where you can remove them and spread the leaves in a single layer on a cookie sheet or on foil. You can use drying trays. And you can use those with window screening or like those, those dryer racks for cookies, for example. Those are great ones to use as well. It does mention the microwave. I've never tried drying in the microwave. You can place on the paper towel. I spelled towel wrong, so I apologize for that. <laughs> and cover with a second sheet. And then put it on high for one to three minutes and then let it cool. Tender leaves such as basil, oregano, tarragon, and lemon balm, or mints. Those have higher moisture content, and so they'll mold um, quickly. If they're not dried well, they will mold. So you can try to hang those, like we mentioned, inside paper bags. Especially if they still have the seeds on them, then the bags can catch the seeds, um, and you can use those again. And then how do you know if they're actually dry? They'll crumble when they're rubbed between your hands. You can also test it by filling a small glass container with the herb inside of it and sealing it. And then put it in the oven for about 15 minutes or microwave for about five minutes. You'll look for any condensation that occurs inside the jar. Then if the moisture is present, then let the rest of the herbs dry even longer. You can also dry them in the oven at 110 degrees or lower. I've actually not done the test. I usually let them out for longer than the general amount. And so I usually don't have to do that test, but it's there if you need it from extension. In terms of storing them, you can dry whole leaves in airtight containers, place them in cool temperate locations, you know, out of direct sunlight. Susan mentioned freezing. This is something that I've done in the past. Um, you can actually buy things like this too. You can buy your frozen garlic already chopped up in little sizes. It's more expensive. So why not do it yourself? Uh, like she said, mentioned freezing in, in oil or water. You can also freeze them flat if you want. When you're cooking, try to use less amount of the dried herbs than the fresh ones. And this gives you an example, a tablespoon of finely fresh cut herbs is equal to one teaspoon of crumbled dried herbs and then a quarter to half a teaspoon of ground dried herbs. Um, I always get this mixed up, but you know I like lots of spices and seasoning. So to me, it doesn't matter as much. 
And like we mentioned, flavored vinegars or oils, you know, I saw some conflicting information mentioning whether or not to heat or not for the vinegars, the oils, again, some conflicting information. So to err on the side of safety, we're just not going to discuss it too much. Be cautious and, and err on the side of safety. You can make some flavored butters and creams as well. We've done this in some classes before where you take one stick of unsalted butter or margarine, and then one is three tablespoons of dried herbs or two to six tablespoons of fresh herbs. Any types of herbs or spice you have on hand will work. And then you can also add half a teaspoon of lemon juice and pepper, and then combine them until everything's fluffy. And then you can pack it in a cover container and let it set for at least an hour to just absorb the flavors. I've seen people do this with cream cheese or sour cream or anything like that. But again, because you're adding something to it, just be careful that you're not, you know, introducing more pathogens. I would use that up as fast as I could. Probably would not let that sit for like a week or two in my fridge just to be on the safe side. This is information about the home food preservation virtual class that Susan was mentioning. This is just where you can find it. And I believe we've shared the link before, but it's $15 and it covers a little bit of quick pickling, but not into great detail. They do cover the canning, freezing, dehydration, and fermentation. I highly recommend it. I've done the, a lot of the in-person programming. I've not done the virtual one itself, but knowing the quality of the other classes, I think it's a great deal for $15. Another thing you can try to do is, you know, join the county fair. Um, the county fair is coming up, especially for Arlington. There's the competitive exhibits. So you can try to enter anything that you make into um, the fair. That's a picture from the fair in 2019, where I actually got to judge some of the items and it was a lot of fun. So I, I highly recommend you try to enter and there's also other local fairs you can try to join as well. We've actually had plenty of master food volunteers, master gardeners win uh, prizes over the years. It's kind of, I think, a competition between people <laughs> and bragging rights. And then lastly, you can also donate any extra produce. You know, if you find that you have a lot of produce, you don't know what to do with it, you've run out of friends, donate that produce to a local food pantry. The Plot Against Hunger Produce Bagging Center is in Rock Spring Church. And they're accepting donations coming up in August on Mondays and Thursdays. You can donate directly to food pantries as well. That link there will, will provide a list of pantries within the Arlington, Alexander Falls Church area. If you live in elsewhere, look into where your pantries will take some of the excess produce. Some reliable resources that we mentioned. The So Easy to Preserve from the National Center for Home Food Preservation. This is through University of Georgia, and this is the one that, that Susan was mentioning. They are kind of considered the experts in this, and so always refer to them. You can also refer to USDA's Complete Guide to Home Canning and the Ball Blue Book and their website. And I think Susan had that book as well here. Any manuals that come with your canning supplies are also great. And then some other additional resources for some of the things we mentioned. That main link is for Virginia Cooperative Extension Food Preservation Resources. You'll find all sorts of topics there. If you want the one directly for quick pickling, for ways to use herbs, and then freezing fruits and vegetables and drying herbs. So there's a variety of information there. And then Susan's gonna come back to answer one of the questions that we had earlier. So this is the So Easy to Preserve book and I'm answering the eggplant question from earlier. Nothing at all on canning eggplant, but it says here, freezing. Harvest before seeds become mature and when color is uniformly dark. Wash, peel, and slice one third of an inch thick. Prepare quickly, enough eggplant for one blanching at a time. Water blanch for four minutes in one gallon of boiling water with half a cup of lemon juice. It's a lot actually, but uh, again, four minutes, one gallon of water, half a cup of lemon juice. Cool, drain, and package, leaving half inch headspace, seal and freeze. So that's their um, recommendation. I also wanted to mention one other thing I didn't say before and should. When you're freezing things on that rimmed baking dish, if you can use a piece of parchment paper or one of those silicone baking mats, that's a good idea. You don't want to freeze things in aluminum foil or wax paper because it'll stick and you will never be able to get that off of whatever you freeze. And I realized I forgot to show you some of the herbs that I had here. These were from the garden here in Farlington. So this is, this is some oregano and you'll see this one actually has some of the the leaves, they have not turned into seeds. They haven't flowered just yet. Um, so this is kind of picked right before the seeds have formed. You'll see there is some um, discoloration on these leaves. Now, again, I am not a gardener, so I'm not as familiar with what some of these spots are. I don't know if you can still eat it. I would probably avoid one that's a little bit more on the darker end. 
but some of these other ones that have a little bit of light spotting, I've still used them, but again, err on the side of safety. It could just be something that isn't as important. And then like we mentioned, you can take the pieces, you know, maybe remove some of the top pieces, take a rubber band and just, um, I'm just going to remove some, probably do a larger bunch than this, but just rubber band them on. You can then hang them up wherever you're trying to dry them. And then the other one, this is a sage. I think this one might've had some bruising on it. I can't remember if it, I can't find it now. Um, yeah. So for example, here, the bruise part, you know, try to avoid that if you can, when you're trying to uh, preserve anything or, or freeze or, or dry them. So that's just some examples here. Um, any questions? Does harvesting after flowering and seeding affect the taste of the herbs? That I am not 100% sure of. I think they just want you to avoid the flower part. I don't know that it takes, affects the flavor as much. I know certainly with cilantro that bolts in the summer. Yeah. Once it flowers, it definitely tastes different. Yeah. So. And then the chive blossoms are wonderful. and edible so it's yeah but so you can it, always save those seeds you know to use for later with the stems if if folks are going to dry them and then crush them can should they crush everything including the stems or should they only crush the sleeves or does it depend on the herb that's a good question i think if they're tender yeah if they're tender stems of things like parsley for example or basil sure you can just go ahead and chop those yeah. in whatever you're doing but i think anything that's stocky you know rosemary you certainly wouldn't I, I think it's sort of a judgment call yeah I know with with cooking you know cilantro stems is where most of the flavor is mm -hmm. so in that sense that that would lead me to believe that yeah you can probably still use those stems all right well it looks like those are all of our questions um Thank you so much for your presentation today. I think we all learned a ton. I will remind folks that this class will be available online in two weeks at mgnb.org. And you can also go to our website to see our upcoming class schedule. I wanna thank Susan and Aisha again for taking time to talk with us today. Thank Julie Hanson Swanson for managing the chat box as always, and just wish everyone a wonderful weekend. Um, thank you so much for joining us today.